Today we are going to talk about um, scientific integrity in the open sci in an open science. Um, I kind of assume that <laughs> science is now kind of open, more open than it used to be, at least. And so um, I will talk to you a bit about the link between scientific integrity, open science, and pretty much also um, perspectives on scientific integrity uh, linked to um, I know the current technological ecosystem or well, I'm, I'm trying not to spoil you too much, but you'll see what I will talk about very quickly. So just to uh, come back to uh, where I'm from, because so we're um, in this webinar, um, thanks to Circle U, the Circle U Alliance. And so I'm from Université Paris-Cité in Paris. Uh, and uh, just for a little bit of information, but um, Paris-Cité is actually a merger between two older universities. Uh, Diderot and Descartes, and uh, so it's a pretty big university in Paris, so we're, there are 62,000 uh, students, undergrad, I think, and 3,500 3, graduate students, so it's a big university. And here is the headquarter where I work, and uh, so as you can see, it's pretty old. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask you guys, where are you from? Uh, and uh, so I listed all the university from Circle U, but um, obviously if you're from somewhere else, um, you can uh, enter other. Um, last time there were a lot of people from Belgrade and Pisa and uh, a few from my university as well, uh, but I see that it's pretty much the same thing today. Um, people from Oslo as well. Um, King's College, UC Louvain. I see Pisa in the chat as well. Okay, so a lot of people from Pisa, I see, and uh, University of Belgrade, and a few others from other university. And there's there there's one person from my university as well. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to go to the next slide just to ask you if you are a master's student, a PhD student, postdoc, a tenured uh, researcher, congratulations if you are, or just someone with a different role as I am, because I'm a research um, a librarian. Obviously, if you're just here because you're curious, just write other. <laughs> Okay, a lot of uh, uh, PhD students uh, and uh, postdocs as well. Um, so I didn't say that at, at when I started, but uh, I have a PhD in uh, cognitive psych and I did a postdoc as well. So I uh, share your struggles um, <laughs> and uh, the difficulties to, I mean, to navigate, uh, navigating all these issues about scientific integrity, open science. So. Okay, a lot of PhD students. Okay. And uh, just to know in which discipline are you working in? Um, stay general. I mean, it's ju just to know um, what's your yeah, discipline, but I may not understand your PhD topic, obviously. <laughs> uh, okay, earth science, education, history. Medical chemistry, um, linguistics, okay, and all materials. Well, I'm always glad to see that um, open science actually is of interest for every, I mean, of every PhD student. Uh, basically, law, uh, economics, philosophy. Yeah, so I'm glad to see people from all all disciplines, that's great. Um, well, that's awesome. Uh, archaeology, agriculture, computational chemistry, soil chemistry. Okay, well, thank you so, thanks so much for uh, answering. Um, I hope that um, regardless of where you're from, you're going to find 
something interesting and useful for you here today. Um, so just to let you know um, what I'm going to talk about um, pretty much today. So we're going to talk about how open science practices help fostering scientific integrity. And so I'm going to talk about um, uh, pretty classic challenges in scientific integrity and how open science actually helps for that. Uh, but so that's pretty much the past or today, I mean, in terms of what kind of uh, scientific integrity challenges we're, um, we're actually trying to fight. Um, how increasing, op and then we're going to talk about how actually open science actually comes with uh, new challenges as well to scientific integrity, and that will be more about uh, scientific publishing. And so I'm going to talk about predatory uh, publishers as I talked during um, the Wednesday webinar, but I'm going to talk about other type of issues that are linked to publishing, but the uh, uh, pose new threats to scientific integrity. And also I will end uh, by talking a tiny bit about um, obviously about um, new challenges and to scientific integrity and that are linked to um, technological developments. And I will talk about large language models, chatbots. So um, if you're familiar with uh, ChatGPT uh, and la large language models in general. Um, so just to tell you a few words about open science, what it is if you're not that familiar with, I mean, what it entail. Um, so that's a European definition of uh, by Foster. So open science, it's the practice of science in such a way that others can collaborate and contribute where research data, lab notes, and other research processes are freely available under terms that enable reuse, redistribution, and reproduction of the research and its underlying data and methods. So the idea of open science is opening the scientific pr processes, but it's not just accessing them for free. There is also a big question of um, how reusable they are, how, how they can be um, yes, reused by others and how we can actually uh, build a science that is um, cumulative thanks to open science. It's not just about uh, having things for free, if that makes sense. Um, so in France, we have a plan uh, that is a guide for institutions. So uh, it's so we're not our second national plan for open science. And the definition that is given in our context, which is pretty much the same, um, but it emphasized the unhindered dissemination of results, methods, and products for scientific research. And it emphasized also the fact that this opportunity is provided by uh, digital progress to develop open access to publication and data source code and methods. And that's pretty much uh, a way to say that thanks to um, the digitalization of pretty much everything, uh, it's easier now than never to actually um, open, uh, open uh, science and scientific processes. Um, this, I'm not going to go into the detail of that, obviously, but it's just to show you that for any um, scientific process, there are basically um, an open side of it. And so there's open access, obviously, that is pretty famous in terms of what well, I mean, it, it's a big part of open science, historically speaking, uh, but also open data. So meaning that, for example, you can actually uh, have, a, I will, we will see a open component of like how, what you do with your data, but also uh, open workflows, open uh, guidelines, your open um, bibliometric uh, indices, um, open repositories, pretty much everything that is involved in the scientific process um, has an open component. So that's pretty much it. And so it, uh, so there's so much <laughs> in open science. So um, that's also why I come back to that because it's perfectly okay not to know everything about open science. I do not know everything about open science. It's changing all the time. But so there are, uh, it, it may be an open component of anything you're thinking about in um, the scientific process. So open science is a worldwide movement for knowledge dissemination. It actually encompasses uh, a plethora of activities in many domain and uh, from publishing to software development. Citizen science is also involved and it's a beneficial practice. And I'm pretty much going to actually explain to you why it's a beneficial practice. And so I'm going to come back right now to um, more, I mean, 
kind of a bit of a history, the recent history, but of scientific integrity struggles and the way open science can actually um, is can actually be beneficial and is beneficial to um, not do these errors in the future. So, so scientific when we're talking about scientific integrity. Um, so there's a literature, a scientific literature on scientific integrity, um, and this literature pretty much agrees on the fact that scientific integrity is not a black or white um, set of practices. It's more of a spectrum of um, scientific behaviors. And at one end of the spectrum, you have fraud. So what is considered as fraud and pretty much everybody agrees that fraud actually encompasses plagiarism, falsification, and fabrication. So these are frowned upon, universally speaking. Um, these are, this is considered as bad behavior and condemnable behavior in a lot of countries. Um, and on the other side of the spectrum, you have something that would be considered by, I mean, by the, I mean, it's really, it's just the opposite as what we call responsible research practices. So practices that uh, foster scientific integrity. And in the middle, you have what is called uh, questionable research practices in the literature. And questionable research practices uh, describe behaviors that go from genuine research misknowledge to intentionally bad practices. So it actually um, encompasses, again, a very different type of behavior in terms of the uh, volition involved that like you can actually um, have questionable research practices, whether you want it or not, like you have a lot of different behaviors falling into this category. And it, this definition is evolving uh, because there are always new behaviors that we didn't know about or behaviors that we question now and we didn't question before. So that's pretty much where we are in terms of defining scientific integrity. Um, so questionable research practices uh, are a big issue in um, scientific integrity and are kind of the focus on a lot of uh, scientific integrity um, trainings, for example, for PhD students, and I give some of them, uh, because it's maybe easy to understand how fraud is not a good scientific practice. I mean, that kind of uh, makes sense, but um, it's sometimes um, complicated to know how a questionable research practice can actually um, be a problem and why it's a problem. And just to tell you that um, uh, questionable research practices are prevalent against across discipline and countries. Um, this is not uh, just happening in some disciplines. It's pretty much something that is this uh, is debated and present in a lot of disciplines. And it's also something that um, is uh, prevalent across research roles. There's been um, two years ago a question uh, uh, survey. Uh, research integrity survey in um, in uh, the Netherlands that has shown uh, uh, that um, actually the people struggling the most with questionable research practices are PhD students because well there's a pressure obviously uh, in being a PhD student and so it's very often your first uh, research role and it's actually pretty hard for a lot of them to uh, reconcile uh, good research practices with what is sometimes, I don't know, kind of on the on the fringe. So yes, I just wanted to show you that because it's actually something that is prevalent and that is, I mean, we need to talk about. Uh, how is, where is open science in all of this? So uh, open science as a complementary relationship with other uh, type of behavior or uh, practices in um, the research integrity um, ecosystem, if we could say. So there are uh, research, there are papers, and I'm uh, talking about this paper because I think it, the 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 in the image it does is pretty neat. But um, the concept of open science and rigorous conduct of research and transparency kind of go together to actually work on. Um, scientific integrity, they all foster scientific integrity in different ways. And open science, for example, is more about the dissemination of the research input. And so uh, by helping the dissemination, you actually make research uh, more ethical. But for example, conduct of research uh, will be more, I mean, the type of behavior as stated will be more about um, uh, rigorous research practices 
And but so each type of practice is actually linked to another a different step in the scientific process, but they all contribute to um, um, to scientific integrity. Uh, and so open science is kind of a part, it's part to play, it has a part to play in um, actually in scientific integrity. It's not going to solve everything, but uh, it definitely has something to do with fostering scientific integrity. Uh, why uh, should we even care about um, open science and how it could actually help? So um, uh, in uh, the 2010s, especially so in the recent past, there have been um, uh, famous cases of replication crises and uh, the most famous one being the psychology one. So uh, in, the, in the early 2010s, um, um, group of, research, of researchers uh, tried to replicate a hundred high profile psychology findings to actually see if these research were replicable. Uh, it's actually a big question in psychology, but in every science to know well if our results are actually robust. And so this reliability uh, study didn't go um, up the way uh, we hope uh, science to go, meaning that um, the vast majority, 61% uh, of this study did not replicate uh, original results. And as you can see, um, uh, the, the, the black square, the results were that are not at all similar to the original results. And that's like 15%. Uh, uh, um, so that's a lot. Uh, so there's, I mean, so uh, following this, We've been talking in psychology about a replication crisis, meaning that a lot of our results were actually probably um, not false, but not robust, and pretty much um, due to um, statistical chance, if we can say. Uh, and so the question is, what can we do to actually make that better? Because that's pretty much the foundation of the science that is not robust, if we could say. Um, the thing is, it's not, it didn't happen only in psychology. Uh, the problem is it's widespread issue. And um, so the Center for Open Science, which is the group of scientists um, that did the psychology replication uh, project also worked on, so not the same, but um, also they um, led this uh, reproductibility project in cancer biology that didn't go very well too. And I thought it was interesting to see on their website that um, some of their stats actually tell, tell something about um, open, how open science can actually make um, this better. Because a lot of the cancer biology studies were hard to replicate from the start because of a lack of access to a lot of information needed to replicate. And for example, 0% of the study that were selected had a totally described protocol, uh, meaning a protocol that helped to, I mean, that was enough to actually replicate the STEM study. 2% uh, only had open data. So um, pretty much no way of uh, rerunning uh, statistics on available, I mean, no available data. Um, and there was a need to ask for regions, for key regions in, um, in the vast majority of studies. And as you can see uh, in, uh, I mean, in the um, bottom, 32% um, of, exper of experiments had the original author were not helpful of unresponsive. And so that's also a problem. So, and uh, very recently, uh, there, I mean, very recently in the last five years, um, there, there's been a, a looming um, replication crisis in uh, machine learning based science. And that's um, a problem because um, it actually, um, um, uh, it's, it's not just, I mean, it's machine learning science, so it's not in machine learning, but it's actually across a uh, scientific spectrum. And actually, and the thing is that um, it also partly uh, is based on the fact that um, the there's some kind of um, um, 
I don't know what to say, um, obscu <laughs> not obscurity, but it's not, but, uh, it's not easy to know what was in the training data. Um, so there is a problem with that as well in machine learning right now. Uh, these two papers are from 2022. So that's, that's a problem that is uh, happening um, currently. So the cause for replication, the replication crisis or crises, uh, because there's not just the psychology one, um, a few possible explanations have been uh, proposed and um, they make sense in terms of uh, what I'm, why am I talking about them? It's because they actually can partly be um, solved by uh, the use of some uh, open science practices. And uh, so a few explanations include the positive publication bias, meaning the tendency of scientific journals to actually only publish statistically significant results. So I guess you are familiar with that. And the fact that um, it's not very, uh, I mean, it's not easy to, it's still not today, not easy to um, actually to publish replications or negative results. Obviously there are questionable research practices like fraud or data snooping and um, pretty much what I've told earlier, the fact that we don't have access to uh, either the method or the data, and so we cannot replicate. Uh, here you have an example in nature of a survey um, that for scientists, things that contribute to um, irreproducible research, and that's pretty much um, things that we've talked about. Um, there's bad luck at the bottom, uh, but there are much more, much more things than just bad luck in uh, the fact that uh, scientists could cannot replicate um, experiments and results. So why can open science actually help with this? Because if for any given experiment, the rational data sets and methods are available, then we can constantly reassess the robustness of scientific research, for example, uh, by, um, okay, someone is writing on the screen. <laughs> um, attempt to replicate your original experiment. So for example, you can rerun the original method. Uh, we can reanalyze the original data. Uh, that can also help you to avoid <laughs> wasting time because you're exploring a counterintuitive result that looks promising but was actually from statistical chance and you can identify scientific misconduct which is also um, useful obviously and um, the, here is an example so it's an example from uh, so Diedrich Stapel. Diedrich Stapel was a PhD, uh, was a doc, um, professor in social psychology in the 2010th I mean even before but uh, he was pretty famous he published in science so which in psychology is not easy uh, and so he was very high profile but he was actually um, a fraudster um, in very uh, very dramatic in very dramatic sense because as uh, so you have here um cite a uh, quote from his autobiography uh which i thought was interesting to put in um comparison to the um the committee uh report the the committee that actually uh look at his fraud um in detail and so because basically he was saying that uh, he would sit in front of his computer, just open Microsoft Excel and just write up, write data. And so that's basically fraud. But the thing is that um, the committee uh, report kind of says that they had to examine uh, the possible fraud with the original data set and what, with what they have. They don't really know. I mean, they know because some things are copied, but um, in some cases it's kind of harder to know about and so the fact that you have the data after uh, after everything um i mean if the data were asked for publications at the time maybe that would have helped kind of um for um spotting these um problems in the data matrices um and another um, example of that is that, um, so as you probably know, uh, miscon so um, when a paper um, is not accepted anymore by the scientific community for various reasons, uh, articles are retracted, uh, meaning they're kind of canceled. And so the main reason for that is still misconduct today. Um, so studies that 
you have studies that study uh, mis um, retractions and they show that the main reason for retraction is misconduct today. So the thing is that it's after the fact. So meaning that the paper was published and then uh, peculiarities were spotted in either the method, the peer review or other things. But uh, what is interesting is that it's pretty much easy to be sure that uh, a paper is retracted because of plagiarism. So actually it's easy to know that a plagiarism is misconduct pretty much in 100% of the cases of retraction where it was for plagiarism, um, the, we could be sure that it was a misconduct. Pretty much same thing for the review process compromise. So when the pre-review process, so the, when the retraction is due to review process, we can actually uh, judge that it was a misconduct in 100% of time. And so it's something that we can actually um, see and spot. But for example, for data, uh, data issues, it's much harder. And so um, accessing data or asking for data along the, side, the entire process may actually help. And you see how transparency here is key. And I'm just going to give you a few ways that actually um, open science can help um, on, I mean, across the entire science, I mean, process, research process to actually um, avoid this type of uh, problems. And for example, something you can do is pre register uh, your studies. So, pre registering is pretty much saying that you're going to run an experiment on this and this and this, and that you expect this and this and this, uh, that are, your hypothesis are A and B and C and what you're going to do. Um, this is not um, something that, uh, it's not, as you say here, it's a plan, it's not a prison. It doesn't ask, I mean, obligate you to do any, anything. It's just a way to be transparent about what you're trying to do. And it's actually a good practice as well because it actually helps to uh, put a timestamp on your idea and say, well, I'm working on that. And so, um, it can help definitely with plagiarism along the way. Another way to actually um, less rely, I mean, uh, making data's, uh, data and um, scientific, uh, um, statistical um, processes more transparent is to actually publish studies as a registered report as registered reports so register a register report is a publishing format it's not a journal uh, it's a published format that uh, is uh, that's been adopted by more than 300 uh, journals and uh, the most recent one is nature uh, i think it was last week or two weeks ago and so you can actually uh, submit registered reports to a lot of journals and in registered reports you have basically two uh, peer review stages and you have one after you develop and design your study but before data collection so if you are accepted at this stage um, you are accepted regardless of whether your experiment will work or not. And that's pretty important because it also helps you not to develop uh, ad hoc uh, hypothesis to actually fit your data better. Uh, it's more it's more transparent because it helps you to um, tell a story that is actually what is happening and not what you would have liked to happen. And it's even if your experiment doesn't work, you still have a publication. So it's actually something to consider. So you have a second peer review when you write the report to be sure that the report is in the right uh, format. But the um, the acceptance actually depends on the study design and not on the data. Uh, obviously, a few other ways to actually um, treat better with your data better is to learn about data management. A big part of open science is dedicated to learning about the data cycle, learning about fair uh, principles, which is making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I'm just also added um, data uh, DMP, uh, templates that we have of data management plan, which is um, um, some um, a document that explains the very much the life cycle of your data and that is asked more and more by um, research funders, especially by uh, the European Commission and um, national funders actually ask for DMPs very often now. And that's actually, even if you don't have to give a DMP, it's actually pretty good practice because it actually kind of helps you um, 
figuring out what you want to do with your data. Do you, if you want to reuse them, how do you want to store them? And uh, how do you want to describe them as well, which is pretty important. And so it can help with the uh, adding transparency to data. And if, obviously a few other ways is by making your workflow more open by using software that actually uh, are um, interoperable, uh, open source, seeing that, I mean, that help people actually not having to spend a lot of money to rerun experiments. So that's pretty much part of the open um, science um, uh, way of life, if I could say, but also helping uh, assessing the robustness of results. So um, I'm going to uh, talk now about um, practice, new practices and new challenge that uh, emerged uh, from um, the from the the spread of open science and especially open access and um, the scientific ecosystem, and so we're going to talk about uh, how um, yes the the fact that we accept now open access pretty much as um, something that exists and that the majority of um, publications are now open, actually created as well, and we should not, I mean, say it is not the truth because it's actually what happened, we created an entire new market for um, actors that threaten or at least question um, scientific integrity, what it means and where it's going. And so I'm going to talk about that right now. Um, so predatory publishing is pretty much what we think about when we think about um, problems in publishing today especially open access but so uh, if you've been here on um, on wednesday i talked about that uh, in length but so predatory publishing um the definition of predatory publishing is that these this means that it's about publication that prioritize self-interest at the expense of the scholar of scholarship and are characterized by false or misleading information deviation from best editorial and publication practices a lack of transparency or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. So it's pretty much about the um, scientific rigor, but also about um, economical um, economic behaviors. Um, there were a lot of uh, predatory publishers on the Bell's list, which was a list of um, a blacklist of publishers that closed in 2017 uh, and it has been estimated that there are there were 10,000 predatory journals in 2018, uh, 420,000 uh, 420, predatory articles in 2014, but these are old numbers and we may be around 15,000 predatory journals in 2023 today. The main characteristics of uh, predatory publishers and journals is that they provide no or only peripheral preview. They ignore editorial services for publication and they often adopt deceptive tactics to entice submissions and compel payments. Why did, um, where is that coming from? Why do we have a press republishing today? Uh, pretty much so if you've been there on Wednesday and if you did not, uh, you will have to, I mean, maybe rewatch what we talked about on Wednesday, but we spend a lot of time talking about um, the evolution of um, academic and scientific publishing and the fact that um, there was a what is called a serial crisis in the 90s, 80s, 90s, and followed by now an APC-based gold open access in the 2000s and still today. And so now uh, the majority of institutional actors actually uh, pay for article processing charges, meaning charges related to publication, but that uh, are paid by authors, so by scientists, to actually make the article open access. Um, and obviously, the fact um, concurrently to that, we also have the fact that uh, the globalization of digitalization of the internet um, went with uh, the digitalization of academic publishing, and that um, you don't need to have distributors, you don't need to have presses to actually create your own journal. Now you know, just need a server, you need a domain name, and you can do it. And you also have a lot of uh, Western, like the publish or perish mentality of Western countries actually was imported in some developing countries, especially the need to publish in English. And that also contributed to um, the development of predatory publishing. So Bell, uh, the Bell's list was the first list actually um, 
trying to keep uh, a, to keep uh, a record of uh, predatory publishers. Uh, so the list doesn't exist anymore because Jeffrey Bell uh, was harassed by a lot of uh, these publishers and um, so it became increasingly difficult. Uh, some mirrors still exist today, but you also have white lists of predatory publishers and it's pretty easy to find online, but there is no list as uh, there was for uh, as there was uh, the Bell list today. And the predatory publishing definition is pretty hard to actually uh, uh, set in stone because as I as it was the case with um, scientific integrity in general, uh, it's you have pretty much a spectrum of what is considered predatory publishing. So you have pretty obvious predatory publishers, you have uh, um, publishers seen as legit, and then in the middle you have publishers kind of uh, playing on both sides go basically having some um, economic practices that are go or scholarly practices that are going to make them look um, quali quality, I mean, um, high quality. And then you they will have other economic practices, especially that are going to be pretty fraudulent. So it's not easy. And we talk about a gray zone of predatory publishing where you have pre uh, publishers that uh, may be considered uh, mainstream that actually a lot of countries are actually using a lot, but that are kind of in the middle of that. Uh, there are also predatory conferences. Um, I encourage you to go and read this because the, the journey into uh, predatory conference, because I think it pretty much uh, summarizes what it is to go to a predatory conference. But today I wanted also to talk about in more detail about hijacked journals. So that's something that is maybe not very well known. I, I don't think it's well known. But so um, I was saying that it's pretty easy today to actually create your journal, but actually the fishing, in, fishing industry uh, also moved to academic publishing in the sense that um, you have a category of cyber criminals that are buying um, domain names of journals that uh, forgot to renew their um, um, domain names or to actually buy closed domain names or change their names. Uh, and so they buy their name, their domain names, uh, clone their websites basically, and so redirect APCs to their website. Um, the problem is that it would be easy to spot if it wasn't for the fact that um, actually the Web of Science and Scopus sometimes uh, actually uh, register the hijacked uh, website as the legitimate one. And so that also what actually pose a, a real threat to uh, people actually trying to publish with these journals. So just here, for example, you have the example of Arctic, that is a journal published by the University of Calgary um, that has been hijacked at least once because sometimes you can be uh, hijacked several times. Um, and so you can see that the website on the right is much less professional in this case. And you may, but so as you see, like they have articjournal.org. And so that sounds pretty legit. And um, journals websites are not known to be particularly uh, super nice or sometimes, so you don't really know, but you can, maybe guess, but the thing is that if you type in Google Arctic Journal, the hijack one is the first one. Um, so it's it's really hard if you're not looking that well, but um, actually sometimes it's even harder than that. So I'm giving you a, a pretty recent example of uh, Linguistica Anverpienzia, which is a linguistic uh, journal from uh, uh, Belgium. Uh, and so they um, change their names. Uh, they change their name to actually make it longer. And uh, so hijacker used this opportunity to register the old name. And uh, the thing is that even after um, it was spotted and reported to Web of Science and stuff like that, uh, well, it's still going on. Uh, and the thing is that in this case that I thought really interesting, so these screen captures are from today. So um, it's super hard to know which one is the right one. Uh, so the legitimate 
journal is the um, is the um, screen capture on the left, and so that's the website. And as you can see, the hijacked version, you may be, I mean, it's super hard not, I mean, it's pretty much impossible just from the page. Um, actually, to know the difference, you have to go to the archives, and the archives are not the same. And on the hijacked version, if you go to, I took, for example, 2021, that is not on the other website, you can see that there are articles that are um from disciplines that are not covered by this journal so this journal talks about translation and it's only about translation it's translation studies basically and you are for example things about common sports injuries and rehabilitation so that's not i mean these articles are not um from this journal but are still considered sometimes in web of science as a being the, I mean, I from this journal. It's really complicated and it for authors to actually um, find their way here. And the problem is that, for example, 10 papers of the hijack Linguistica on Verpunza ended up on the Wu COVID-19 database. They've been removed since, but so the damage was done and some articles on this hijack journals ended up being on a database that was pretty important for public health. So that's a real issue. Um, and um, it's not easy for authors to actually uh, find their way through that. Another very important issue in uh, publishing today is uh, our paper mills. So paper mills are basically a website where you can actually buy authorship on a publication that is being peer reviewed. So uh, paper mills sell, so they produce fake articles so, and they sell you the authorship. Uh, you may think this is weird and I would never do that, but actually it's getting such an issue that um, uh, may the main publishers at least have entire departments um, investigating this, the, this problem. Uh, just to show you what it looks like. So this is the main, uh, the one, I'm not giving you the name here, but um, this is a Russian website. It's the main one. Um, because there's a main one uh, for um, a, a main paper meal. Um, and so if you go there, you can actually look for, so there are articles for sale. And uh, so they are getting reviewed. They tell you the percentile, where they are going to be indexed, for example, Scopus. And so here you can buy um, the authorship. So obviously buying the first place is uh, more expensive. And so it's in ruble, but it's basically 830 euros for um, first author here. Um, so as I was telling you, this is a big issue uh, in, um, in publishing actually. Um, this is a mil multi-million dollar trade and it's currently um, a big uh, scientific integrity issue in uh, open access publishing. Uh, and so, for example, Clarivate that owns the impact factor and the web of science is actually, um, in, I mean, I've been investigating um, this because, so this paper, I mean, this paper end up uh, in legitimate journals. Um, and how it works is that uh, a group, an author, group of authors submit a paper, and at some point, uh, so they exploit a vulnerability in the publishing process that allow authors to add names to manuscript after acceptance. And so very often journals are like, well, we're not going to accept new, um, new authors at this point, but then um, in some journals, the production in the production offices, you have novice uh, workers, people that are just right out of college and they don't know it's necessarily a bad practice, so they accept. And so that's, um, yeah, they exploit basically vulnerability in the publishing process to um, make this happen. Uh, and why would you do that? Uh, well, you would do that for a lot of reasons. Uh, for example, that um, the pressure is so strong because you need papers. And so why not? It's going to be in a legitimate paper uh, journal. And so just why not buying this? And uh, in some countries, actually, you have, um, 
cash rewards if you publish. So it's actually also a reason uh, to do that. Um, and so uh, <laughs> now that I'm done with showing you the bad side of everything that is happening in open access, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the example of uh, large language models and IA content generation on uh, how, I mean, on uh, new challenges for uh, the scientific process. Meaning uh, what I wanted to say here is that um, scientific technological advances actually also pose new threats and or just new questions about um, what it means to, ha to um, have um, behaviors that respect scientific integrity. So it's just not necessarily bad or good. It's just that it asks new questions. And um, so I obviously want to talk about um, GPT um, and uh, in large language model in general. So uh, GPT is the large language model and chat GPT is the um, conversational layer, the chatbot that is on top of it. But I'm not going to get into uh, what chat GPT is and or GPT, I guess you're familiar with um, with that by now. Uh, there's an entire different question about um, the what it means also for open science in the sense that um, there's the big question of um, having, op I mean, the open source component of um, uh, large language models, uh, an entire question about should that be open source? Uh, um, uh, the creators of OpenAI are currently saying that it was a mistake to be open source. And uh, so there's a debate about um, the open source status of um, large language model that is pretty interesting for open science. But what I wanted to talk about here was more what kind of challenges to scientific integrity this type of scientific advances um, pose actually for scientists. And just a few um a few uh um things for example can large language model be scientific authors uh well that's a question that is asked because at least four papers um since um chat gpt has been uh, launched in november listed chat gpt as an author uh and so at first, many scientists will disapprove, but there was no no guidelines. So that's a question that could be asked, and that was asked. And um, science and nature and the nature group, so Springer Nature, um, um, uh, updated the guidelines saying that you cannot list Chat GPT or large language model as an author uh, of your paper. And in the case of Springer Nature, they also still said that, but you can uh, use large language model in the writing process, but you have, or scientific process, but you have to disclose the use of large language model, which actually use, actually ask a different question. Uh, how useful are they for the scientific process? Should they be disclosed? Should be should they be used? And you have here an example of um, here you have a nature survey on for scientists like have they used chatbots like uh, ChatGPT and to for what what for? And so a lot of people use them for creative fun, but some people use them to um, help with presentation, conducting literature review, which is uh, I would say a big issue because uh, the um, the uh, um, chat GPT cannot um, give you reliable sources uh, in the state it's in, uh, but also to help uh, write grant application or, for example, here to edit a manuscript. So the question is, how um, are we going to let a large language model uh, enter our scientific processes, even if it's, for example, writing rejection letters when you're an editor? I've, so, I've seen people doing that. Um, is it going to write a part of your article? It's just a question. Like we today, we're at this time where I mean we don't know, and that's that's a big issue for scientific integrity. Uh, and one last thing is I think the for me right now as a research librarian, um, the biggest issue for me um, 
linked to li library science is, should we cite a uh, large language model? Are they a source? And so here you have uh, two different universities, University of Waterloo and the Western Australian University, um, giving you two ways to actually cite uh, APA, APA style um, the use of chat GPT and they actually differ because in one case you actually um, in the case of Waterloo they tell you to actually give the prompt uh, the access date etc when on the right side they don't give, tell you to give the prompt but the thing is and some people argue it's kind of the same thing as saying as seen on the internet or as seen on tv the with, without the prompt it doesn't really mean anything and even with the prompt, the fact that the, the um, conversational uh, model of chat GPT actually learns from learns, not GPT, but chat GPT does the conversational layer um, makes that you're not going to have the same answer from one week to another. So can this be a source? Is it a source? Um, and that's a real question. And for now, I think we don't have an answer to that because um, in terms of scientific integrity, we should cite our sources, but is it a source? And so it asks a lot of different questions that we're not ready to answer because it's brand new, but I think are pretty interesting um, for scientific integrity purposes. And um, that's pretty much it for me. I think that was already a lot. 